This is Life Rewired, the Brain Injury Podcast, for survivors, by survivors. And now your host, Rob and Ashley. Welcome to Life Rewired, and I have a special guest joining me for the next few episodes here. His name is Jason Lolly. You have met him before. Hi, Jason. Hello, everybody. We have so much to give you guys today, and this is going to be so awesome. Our topic today is anger and irritability. And Jason told me right before the podcast, he has a lot to say on this topic. So I'm interested to hear what you have to say, Jason. Yeah, ain't that the truth? I think um, any TBI survivor should certainly have a lot to say on that topic. Right? Absolutely. So if you yeah. don't, if you don't, you're not a true TBI survivor. If you if you don't, you ain't being honest with yourself. You know, you're not this being honest true. with the experience that we're having. And which is, I mean, I guess that's part of it, right? Like sometimes we aren't really seeing reality. And, yeah. you know, one of the things I had to learn through brain injury was being able to obtain or somebody that was trustworthy for me to be a real world reference point. Because mm -hmm. I wasn't sure what was real world and what was fabricated in my head. It's hard to find people that actually know what you're going through and know how to reel you back in, I guess, when you go off the deep end. Cause we do, don't we? Yeah. And you know what? That's the, man, you just led me right into the irritability <laughs> anger story. So you're talking about how they, how they learn how to interact with us. Right. Right. So you're like, you, <laughs> The fact that you even brought up anger and irritability, uh, I'm about to do a video. I'm going to release a video like I always do um, on uh, an experience that I had. But since we have this platform, let's talk about it. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I went on a drive. Uh, I used to work at a private country club for 15 years as a valet manager. And so uh, members used to pay me in the summer, summer to drive their cars to their summer homes or transport their dogs and stuff like that. I really did That's work cool. with 1%. And yeah, and um, I've been able to um, keep some of those relationships. They're very dear friends to me and family. But uh, I drove a car and a, a, a giant Bernese mountain dog, 125-pound Bernese mountain dog. Oh, wow. 19 hours and two days up to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Now, I can do that with brain injury because it's linear. It does drain me because yeah. we're processing a lot of information, right? So Absolutely. I have to be very gentle with myself when I get home. I have to make sure that I have very limited sensory stimulation. I mean, ideally, what I really need is a sensory deprivation tank, <laughs> right? So I can really rest and recover. Um, but so... Uh, I did this drive. I got up there. Um, you know, it was an emotional experience for me. The person that I drove for, um, you know, they, they have just been diagnosed with early onsets. Alzheimer's. So, um, of course, my dogs are going to bark. Hold on real quick. Hey, sure. get down. Get down. Um, uh, so, you know, we had, um, you know, it was a very emotional experience for me because, you know, I could really see a lot of the similarities and connections in brain injury, right? Because like with Alzheimer's, yeah. you, get, you get the plaque in between the synapses. And mm -hmm. with, you know, and, and with our brain injuries, what, what I've seen is, um, you know, cognitive declines, cognitive decline. Like we're, our neuropathways yeah. got damages, so damaged, so our synapses aren't operating normally either, right? right? And so I could just see, you know... You know the experiences when we get lost, Rob, like where we're talking and then we lose our thought. Yes. But I want to point something out about that. When we talk about that, you know what happens is it's not like we just lose our thought like we normally do. We like I like I don't know about you, but for me, like I get lost. Like I like all of a sudden went Zip, and I like glitched out. I forgot everything and it's like, like everything freeze. went black. Yeah, yeah. And if you were to really pay attention to our eyes, right, it's like we're not very present. Mm -hmm. Right? We, 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 oh, yeah. we zapped out for it. And I watched that happen to him. And it broke my really? heart. Yeah. And he Gosh. goes, I'm sorry I got lost. And I said, hey, man, nothing but grace and compassion here for you, you know? Yeah. So I do this drive. I fly home the next day. It was a long flight. It was a long day. I get home. I'm totally... You know, we, I think you've seen my, my video on the brain battery, right? And so I'm yep. so depleted. 
I'm not functioning. And I come home, my dad's watching my dog for me, which I'm so grateful for. And, um, you know, he's got Caitlin Clark's playing in her first basketball game. So he wants to watch it, but I don't really watch many sports. I keep my home very calm, you know, for brain injury reasons. Yeah. And so I'm sitting here, we're talking, you know, my emotions came up about that member. I started crying. I, was, I don't, I don't hold, I release. I let my emotions flow through me because otherwise they stay inside of me and I am already having a hard enough time regulating. Yeah. <laughs> and then when they come out, they really come out. And if we keep them inside, it's like a two liter soda bottle, right? If we would have dropped that suit, two liter soda bottle and it, and it didn't explode and all that pressure built up, right? Maybe mm -hmm. I dropped it five or 10 more times, but one time it's going to explode. And yep. when it does, it's messy. It doesn't care what's around. We're the body, we're, right. the, we're the bottle. Those emotions is the pressure, right? Uh -huh. And so how do we do that? How do we stop the bottle from exploding? We twist the cap, right. we vent it out, right? We have to let it, we have to release. And uh -huh. so, um, so I came home and I'm talking to my dad and, you know, we have opposing political views. And so, um, we started talking and I got upset and, you know, so, you know, I handled it very well at first. I was being very respectful. I was, I, I wasn't in a TBI rage until I was. Oh, wow. And as we all know, as TBI survivors, those rages are very scary. They're scary for everybody, They're for the people who are having to face us and for us. You know, normally when I am in a TBI rage, or at least in my past, I've disassociated so much that I was literally behind myself screaming to stop, but I couldn't stop. No, you can't. You can't until it's out. It, until it's out or, or until yeah. whatever it is that we're interacting with stops interacting with us. Uh huh. Yeah. And so that, that that's where we're going to get to. So, uh, you know, my dad and I, uh, we, it starts to happen. We get in a, a little bit of a conflict. We're acting like adults until, you know, he really trauma triggers me, but also as he trauma triggers me, that's too much for my brain to process in my depleted state. So in my depleted state, Whenever that happens, I call this version of me the shadow king. I've done a lot of trauma version work, and I have recognized that when I reach a point in my uh, depleted battery or in my brain and I'm not functioning, I can barely process information any longer, et cetera, that I'll reach a point to where it feels like any more information coming to me is like an attack that's going to kill me. That's yes, what it I feels like. That. Yes. yes. And, and then at that point, it feels like a pit bull backed into a corner. Mm -hmm. And so I latch on and I freak out and I rage to shut down everything that's coming at me. So, you know, my dad keeps trying to cool the temperature in the room. He's trying to calm <laughs> me down. And now I, I need everyone to truly understand because I speak about this in vulnerability and the vulnerability of the accountability for me. But I speak about the guilt and the shame of when I traumatize somebody like my own father like that, right? Yeah. I've had to do a lot of work to have compassion for myself that I do have a brain injury, that I'm doing the best I can. I'm always engaged in therapies and I've gotten better at managing this. You know, one of the things my dad said afterwards was, hey, like, sometimes I forget because you haven't been like that in so long. Oh, but wow. he has never seen me like this. I mean, visualize somebody just short of punching holes in the wall and throwing things. I got my veins popping out of my face is red. The veins are popping out of my face. And like, I'm screaming, I'm losing my voice. And all I'm trying to do is shut it down. Yeah. Right. I'm just trying to right. shut it down. I keep saying, I need you to shut up. Like, you know, and he's like, I don't know how to help. And I'm like, say that one more time. I swear, you know, and I'm just you're like, making it worse. Yes. I was like, I was like, you're not, I'm trying to cool the temperature in the room. I said, I need you to recognize when you're adding gas, when your words are gasoline to the fire, please. Mm -hmm. Right. And so finally I got it through to him. Like, I just need you to stop. Like the more you talk, I latch. 
and yeah. I have to protect myself. It's, it's literally a protective measure. And, and so here was, here's what the thing I tried to regulate myself. I was present for the most part. I wasn't completely disassociated. I had enough ability to try to go regulate myself. So I take my dog out in the backyard and I do some breath work. I'm doing, you know, four seconds in one second, hold six seconds out. Right. I'm doing yeah. everything I can in my breath work to reset my central nervous system. Um, it's not working. <laughs> and so I come back inside I get hot again. It starts off. So I break, I disengage. I, I go and I lay down in my bed and I just hold my dog, hoping that the oxytocin, I'm not the only one. So um, I was hoping the oxytocin would help calm me, right? Right. It didn't. I was still so hot. I was still, my, everything was so boiling. Yeah, and my go to, my go to for this is uh, cold showers. Really? Yes, it will immediately reset your central nervous system. It's I hadn't you know, heard of that. Yes, and it, it, it's the ninety second mark when you well one it'll jar you. It's so shocking that you're just like, oh wow, okay, I'm back to reality. I'm present again, <laughs> you know. Um, but the other is, you know, it, it, I do a lot of ice baths, and the ninety seconds resets your central nervous system. And wow, so, I did not yes, know that. Yeah. yeah um, I've, yeah, it's really helpful, man. Unfortunately, I live in Phoenix. Oh. And it's 100 degrees. So <laughs> the water is not getting that cold. <laughs> so I literally took like a full shower. Like, and so to, to wrap this story up, I, the, the last go to was me is medical marijuana. It helped reframe me. So, you know, I, I, that was the one thing that brought me back this time. And I was, you know, I was trying not to, I try to really keep a balance not to because, and, and keep it as minimal as possible. Yeah. I have learned that more so in my rages is when it's the most helpful for me. And so, um, I did, I, I, I grabbed, I grabbed the joint and I'm going backyard and I calmed down. Like, and it took me a full hour to calm down. And I know that if I hadn't have used medicinal, used, used my medicinal marijuana, that I would have gone to bed that way. I would have woken up that way and I wouldn't have been able to come back yet. Yeah. And you'd still be coming you, back. You know? Yeah. Right. Right. Not to mention when we rage like that, right. Um, the stress that it puts through our brain. Uh huh. And, and that it actually is making us worse. Right. And then you feel bad after the fact, and now you are battling guilt and shame. You've got a whole uh -huh. new battle going. A hundred percent, which makes you feel unworthy and a burden and all the trauma spiral that we go uh -huh. into. Right. And so, um, I'm, I'm sitting on the back patio and I'm talking to my dad now. We're able to be calm. And he goes, Jason, I just don't know what your trauma is with me. And I said, Dad, I've done so much work on trauma. I haven't found those versions yet. I haven't found them yet. I said, but here's what I do know. I feel very unseen and I feel very unheard from you. Mm -hmm. And I, so I go, so this is what happened. I need to walk you through. I was completely depleted. You know, you saw three different versions of me. I walked in in my higher self when I was in my eight C's of self leadership. And then I got upset. And then I have, you know, I've done a lot of internal um, inner children work, these trauma versions. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a counseling therapeutic modality called internal family systems where we recognize the trauma versions that show up in the middle of us being triggered and we reparent them. It's really amazing work. That is man. amazing. I have increased my tolerance to my traumas tenfold in one year. Really? That is amazing. Yes, because of it. Yeah. Yeah. And we can do a whole other episode on that. <laughs> yes. Uh, but um, so my dad, I go, so your dad, I go, you met my highest self. Today, I go, you met who I call Gangster Lolly. <laughs> Gangster Lolly doesn't like to be disrespected. So he shows up. And when he shows up, I've done reparenting with him. He's no longer as gangsta gangsta as he used to be. <laughs> so now what he is, is he's direct and assertive and respectful. Cool. But the moment everything became the attack, mm -hmm. that's when the Shadow King showed up, is what I call yeah. it. Yeah. 
And he's the one that protects me when I can't process any more information. He's trying to shut everything down. He's so nasty and mean. And so we're sitting back there. I go, so these are the three versions you saw. Here's why they show up. Here's what happened. And I, and he goes, well, he goes, son, I'm just so used to being in a, when I'm in a conversation that's hot like that, trying to bring the temperature down. And I, he goes, it's unusual for me to sit and stop talking. Mm. And I said, I'm going to ask you to please, if you ever see me start getting hot, leave me alone. Yeah. Let me rest. My brain now needs rest. I actually, you know, like I'm at that point. I need to rest. And so I need some space. If it can't be positive, then we can't engage. Oh, absolutely. You know? That's like going to a woman and, so, and saying, shh, calm down, calm down. <laughs> you, you, well, dude, you ain't yeah. going to do that. The gasoline. <laughs> yeah, the gasoline on the fire, right? It's like, the hell Kaboom. you Boom. <laughs> yeah. So, but here's, here's the amazing part and what you led me right into the story to bring this back full circle is um, my dad looks at me after I talk about all the guilt and all the shame that I'm feeling in that moment. You know, I'm being open. I'm being honest. I'm communicating. I'm not holding these things in, yeah. right? And um, he just looks at me and he goes, you know, Jay, I just, I'm, I'm grateful that I got to see this from you today. I've never seen it this bad. Uh, and um, now I know how to show up for you in those moments. I saw something. Now I know to hold my tongue. Now I know to let you calm down and rest. Now I know why that's happening to you. Right? That's amazing. And yeah, yeah my immediate response was, Dad, thank you for taking something that could be that when someone has traumatized you with conflict, that you instead took the time to listen, to see them, mm -hmm. and to use it as an opportunity to be there for them, to learn about them, to understand them. Now, do you remember what I said my trauma triggers of my father was? Uh, was it the... Uh... Feeling unseen yeah. and feeling unheard. So here he is hearing me. Here he is seeing me. So in this moment, the rage actually ended up being something that helped us grow. But it was because of how we handled it. I took accountability. I communicated. I managed. And we, once I calmed down, we came back to the table and we had a calm conversation. Well, I commend you for, for being so mature that you could take accountability for that. It's not easy to own your own demons. It's not. And especially as you a train, as a uh, traumatic brain injury survivor, we are so often discounted and and I don't want to say that we're using our injury as a crutch, but some of us, I, I think are not wanting to take the accountability because we have the injury in our back pocket. So we have to do a little yeah. bit of soul searching ourselves too. I mean, it does work both yeah. ways. It does work both ways. You know, um, I will say that depending on the severity or symptoms that some that people may be having with their brain injury that depending on the point in their recovery they may not be able to even be have the awareness to self-reflect in that way yet this is and true. that might be further down the line yeah and so um, i definitely want to offer them that grace and compassion for those who can't self-reflect for those who are are really struggling in those rewiring like you know you and i we get we we still are able to articulate and i'm i in in certain yeah. ways you know obviously it's a massive struggle oh yeah you know? i mean i used to be able to deal with the public a lot easier than i do now one-on-one oh. -on -one, you would not even know i had an injury but you put a bunch right. of people in a room with me and I'm like a blabbering idiot. We went to a concert last weekend. Um, I believe it was last weekend, you know, TBI, uh, but yeah. um, I met an artist. What day was that? I don't know. <laughs> a lot of my stuff happened yesterday. My wife says, no, that happened last month. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> it so happened. True, okay. Let's just agree that it yeah. happened. Yeah. 
but I said that to say this. I, I met an artist that I really admire, and I could not even work the camera on my phone. He he was gracious enough to take my phone and take my picture, and I was stuttering. He probably thought I was the biggest idiot in the world, but he showed me so much grace and kindness. I just couldn't, I couldn't get over it. But yeah. that's just one of the things that I have to deal with, you know? Yeah. And, you know, like, like one of the things for me is like when I'm, you know, as an artist, as a performer, right? Mm -hmm. um, I have a very hard time going to certain shows. They're too loud. The lights are too bright. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, I mean, I'll stand on a stage sometimes if it's full on stage and it's got those lights. Um, I'm actually considering starting to wear sunglasses because they were so they, they take me out of my poem. Yeah. It's already a lot for me to remember a three to five minute poem. Right? Yeah. Like I've already I've worked so hard to commit that to memory and I have to work harder to commit that to memory now. You know? Um, oh, yeah. But like when I get there, sometimes there's too many people, the proximity, my spatial awareness is off. Uh -huh. I mean, that was a big thing for me is that I we're back. We had a small difficulty but you know what we're gonna roll with it because that's who we are that's who, that's we, who are, we are you know did you, hey do you even remember what i was saying because I, I don't no clue well you know i guess that's kind of brain injury isn't it learning how to let go right. and, and just let that flow i don't know so rob i got a question for you sure my question for you is how did that used to impact you in the early stages of your brain injury when you would forget everything you were talking about Oh my gosh. I would shut down. Mm -hmm. I would literally shut down. I was so frustrated that I could not remember something that I was just done there. Yeah. And there was no coming back from it. Right. We beat ourselves up pretty hard. Don't we? Oh yes. I was yeah. probably my biggest opponent. Oh, I'm for sure, sure. A lot we, of people will uh, say that. I, I would say, uh, I would, if it ain't a hundred percent of brain injury survivors, it's I don't nine, know what nine, to say. Point nine, 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 nine. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> um, but like I used to get really, really angry. It would uh, like, I would, I wouldn't, not kind to myself. Uh, I didn't have compassion around that. Like, Hey dude, you got a brain injury. It's okay to forget things. I was embarrassed. I felt shame, you know, yes. Especially um, I'm the used shame. to being, yeah, I'm used to being really articulate. So it was very hard for me. Um, and even now, even though I'm as articulate as I am, uh, everyone would be like, oh, you're so articulate and you know, mm -hmm. you're in such good shape. And I think we talked about that in the last episode and it really, yeah. it really did. It, it really hurt me because mm -hmm. what they didn't know and they couldn't see is that um, my brain was traveling such a longer pathway to, to, for word finding. Yes. And I was and getting I more and more still. tired. Yes. It wears you out. It wears us out, man. You know, so yeah. yeah. You know, brain I was thinking earlier and this doesn't really have too much to do with anger, but I was thinking earlier about why there is such a disconnection between, you know, brain injury survivors and the neurotypical people because, and it just, it, it dawned on me that it's, it's what they don't know for sure. But the perception is, and the movies and television shows are very guilty of making it be like that. When you hear, before you had a brain injury, if you heard someone had a brain injury, you're thinking they're not smart anymore. They're, they're slow that they don't have any education. They can't do anything. And then you see us, we look normal. So Sound what, normal. what their expectations of a brain injury is, is not realistic. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. And, and, and it's, and unfortunately it's uneducated. Yeah. And I and that's why I have such a, a a passion and a fire to speak in the ways that I do to a um, help 
brain injury survivors identify what they might not be able to, because I've walked that journey, I've identified mm-hmm. it. And I said, Hey, do you experience this too? Right? <laughs> yeah. Have you experienced this as well? And then they're like, Oh my gosh, I had no idea how to explain that. You know, um, lost my train of thought where I was going with that. I'm going to let it flow. <laughs> let it flow. Let it fly let out it the door. <laughs> and then, <laughs> bye. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, there, it's there hard. is that big disconnect though between the the, yeah. the brain injury survivor and the neurotypical because they can't see it; it's invisible. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I'm life coaching someone right now, and um, through some trauma, and one of the, the ways that I told her, I said, "Look, uh, when I." When people would ask me, I would tell them, hey, I need you to imagine like my wheelchair is in a brain because if I was in a wheelchair, you would know what to expect from me. You wouldn't expect me to get up and run. And so then she's like, okay. And I was like, you trying to like, after you're having a massive depressive episode, go out and be social. You ain't got no legs. (laughs) Forget about it. Forget about it. It ain't happening. Yeah, so our joke is now that she's a bit more realistic with herself about I ain't got no legs. <laughs> like, we need to like, make a shirt that this says I don't have legs. I ain't got no legs. <laughs> or wait a minute, my brain has no legs. For real, right? Yeah. So I mean and the rage the, I I think the important thing I, I would love to discuss is really the guilt and the shame that comes Mm. around that. I I really, really, really hope that caregivers that hear this, that survivors hear this can work on the compassion piece to understand that this is not who we want to be. It's not how we want to be. And it upsets us greatly to ever act in ways that we actually probably condemn. Isn't that the truth? To be our own worst nightmare? Mm-hmm. We're, we're living a nightmare already, but now we're like really, we're acting the character. We're playing like the Dr. narrative. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, you know, that's why my first doctor tried to diagnose me with bipolar. Yeah. Yeah. No, buddy. This is brain injury. <laughs> yeah. You know. Uh, it, it surprises me the the lack of is it knowledge or is the lack of concern from, from some of our medical professions? Both. I'll say both. Yeah. Yep. You know, it's easy to just say, ah, take a pill. Pills don't always work. Ooh, man, you're going to open that one up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I call, I, one, I'm very tired of what I call medical abusers. The doctors that show up and don't listen to anecdotal evidence, right. the doctors that show up and weaponize our charges against us, mm-hmm. you know, the doctors that manipulate us. And then, you know, as you're talking about the medications, you know, I understand the need, and especially in the early part of brain injury, we've opened up, we're very sensitive, we don't know what's going on, we're emotionally right. unregulated. But is a chemical stray jacket really the answer? Mm-hmm. And when I, when I ask that, because as I've done a lot of trauma work, when we stuff things down and we numb things and we can't feel it and we have to feel it to process. Right. And um, the other thing about uh, the medications with brain injury is I've been on six. Okay. I've been on six different medications. Each one of them was at least a week or two of me barely being able to function the first moment I got on it. Uh Or there's that that FaceTime thing. Um, (laughs) Or a week or two, or, or, you know, which how do I work? How do I, how do I sustain a job if I'm barely, um, my mental is so fractured, yes. not even from brain injury anymore. It's from the medications I'm trying to to do. And you're a zombie. Yeah. 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 Um, or you're rageful or you're suicidal yes. or, you know, and then here's, here's the point that I'm getting to these medications they give us for our brain injury. The side effects are our symptoms. 
how are we supposed to know what's real? How can Amen. we show up in your office and say, well, this is how I feel. Mm -hmm. Well, like if I tell you and I express that I have suicidal ideations, how do we know that's not brain injury or how do we know that's not um, the medicine? My first medication, it was absolutely the medication. The rest yeah. of my ideations were never my medication. It was always my brain injury. It was always my circumstances, right? And I speak about that vulnerably because I, I accept and I embrace my darkness. I, I celebrate my ability to persevere through those moments. I have suicide intervention training. I just didn't know it was going to save my life. Wow. Yeah. I used to teach bullying prevention in schools, buddy. And so it was like my thing, like I wrote a book on it. And so like, if I was going to go and help kids who are being bullied and the kids who are bullies, right? Uh -huh. Because oftentimes the kid who was bullied becomes a bully because they don't have self-awareness and they don't understand how to communicate what they're feeling. Somebody took the power away from them. And let's be honest, people who take power from people my dogs might bark here in a second because I see the mailman. Um, but there they are. <laughs> hey, hey, I, hey, leave it. Good boy.